Today for our Vinci podcast here, we have our CEO and founder, Salva Bjornsson. Welcome, Salva. Thank you very much, Chris. Nice to be here with you. Good. How are you then? So talk to me a little bit about yourself. So tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, I'm, well, I started originally in Reykjavik, Iceland, where I was, was born. I was, uh, grew up there. I was uh, a sports fanatic, like uh, did martial arts, football, anything that you could, could really get myself into. My, my big thing was, was martial arts. I competed in karate for uh, quite a few years internationally. Wow. Uh, but then I had a tumor uh, in my lower back, which had to be removed. And, and that sort of uh, put me out of sports when I was just around 20 years old when I, when I had that. Uh, and then my focus switched a little bit and I, I started looking and that's about the same time as I start losing my hair. Right. Uh, so so, so the, I don't know if it's because of that or, or that was just my time. Uh, and, and that's the time where, where my sort of a hair loss journey really starts. Um, and I have a, have a story about that because my, my aunt, she used to cut my hair and she always told me when I was a kid, you got some great, really, really thick hair, you know, you're never going to be bold. And I always believed that. So when I, when I was 19, 20 and it started creeping back and, and somebody actually said to me, you know, you're going bold, it's going mm -hmm. back. I said, no, you're crazy. I'm never going to go bold. I got great hair. And then it, then it sort of started settling in a little bit. And from that time, really, which is quite a few years ago, I've, I've been obsessed with anything that has to do with hair, hair loss and, and hair restoration. And it's been, been quite a journey, really, to, to go from there, where I was there and knew very little, to, to when I'm sitting today. When we speak to our clients um, in Vinci, um, they normally say, yeah, there is a pinpoint that yeah. there's, a, there's, there's something that actually happens in someone's life that they yeah. think now's the time to get a hair transplant. It's because something someone said something um, yeah. or it might just be because they've seen their self on an odd day and they think, actually, it's too far now. I, I, it's too I, far I, gone. Yeah, you, you see a lot of people talk about when they saw a photo, you know, they went to a wedding or they went to an anniversary or something and they saw a photo and it, it caught the back of their head or, they, or from a different angle. So, yeah, yeah there, there is this one trigger point, I think, that really pushes you over the, over the limit of mm -hmm. what you can take. Mm. Where was so was would you say that was it? You you saw yourself receding. Someone said to you your hair was receding back, or was there a, another point that made you think I'm going to have a hair transplant? It, it took me. I mean, from the time that I started noticing it to actually had the hair transplant is is about ten years. So through that period, I mean, we we talking back in the sort of 1990s that mm. people didn't really know that much about hair transplants. It was not something that was really easily on display. Uh, so I started, like most people do, went to my GP uh, and asked him what I could do. He said, basically nothing. You have to just embrace it. There is, mm. and, and he was bold himself. Uh, so this, this was my sort of a first attempt. Uh, kind of a, tried to put this in the, in the back of my head for a while. Uh, then I started looking for other things. I went to some, some clinics that existed back then. Uh, they did some cleaning. They gave me some minoxidil, which was the first mm. real medication, really, that I got on, some, some shampoo treatment. And it kind of uh, on and off on that, uh, discovered finasteride uh, a few years later, got onto that as well. And then it was by the time that I had my hair transplant, I was with an advanced Norwood 3, so I had like right. a little bit of hair here in the front, but pretty much all this frontal area area was gone and and that was that was really the big moment for me because i realized i'd been suffering like this for such a long time and so many people out there without realizing there actually is a really good solution there mm. in hair transplants and from that we went into uh, we, we, in the clinics i saw some people were not candidates for hair transplants so we went into doing all the types of treatment like mesotherapy prp microscopic pigmentation and etc but uh, it, it, i mean it's changed a lot it's a mm. completely different business today than it was you know 10 15 years ago yeah, I mean, you said around sort of Norwood three, and that was that was your point that made 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 you do it. Um, it's strange because at that point you can start really seeing sort of the shape of the head, can't you? Yeah. And when you start looking looking at yourself front on. Yeah, and um, it, it changes the whole shape of your face. This is what what people don't realize that your your hairline it gives you the sort of first, the, the proportions of your whole face. Mm -hmm. So the so the rule of thirds from Leonardo da Vinci is is this should be one third, the one third is here, and the one third is about your hairline. If the hairline then starts here on the middle of your head, this, this goes all out of whack. Mm. So people actually start looking different. It's not just the hair. You, you recover so much more when you have a hair transplant than just your hair. You really cover your looks as well. Mm. So this is a little bit about Vinci then. So how did that start? How did you, how did you start that? Yeah, so after, after my hair transplant, I, like I said, I, I was obsessed before, but I got even more obsessed. <laughs> so, so after having the hair transplant, I actually ended up hiring all the team that did the hair transplant on me and we wow. opened two clinics one in Malaga Spain and another one in, in London 
uh, and and that's really where it all grew from. And and it was, I mean, I never planned to have you know th- thirty odd clinics all around the world. But from the beginning, we were set up with two clinics in in different countries. And I think that really set the tone for what was to come. So we were always set up differently than uh, than uh, one clinic that set up in one place. Uh, ev- everything was a little bit more international. We already had everything in in more than one language. We were doing Spanish. We were doing uh, doing English, obviously. And then from there we grew into you know Brazil, into Africa, USA, all over the world. And that's all happened very organically. That's there's many there's many techniques aren't there uh, for hair transplantation how have they changed over the years well they've changed changed massively i mean if if i go back to these sort of older techniques which is even before my time in the when you're talking about like the 60s and 70s the people were doing scalp reduction which is quite a, a barbaric procedure really mm. so you needed a lot of flexibility in the scalp to do a scalp reduction and if they did not have that they would insert a little bit of a balloon underneath you'd, you'd cut here there is like a little balloon put in there and they would pump it up and it stretches your scalp mm. and then you have to come back you have to pump a little bit more and you pump a little bit more until you have enough to cut out and they do what they call a lazy s so it's like a line that really cut through here down here and then you pull the scalp together so if the wow. boldness started here now it's going to start here and for this to be successful you need a few surgeries to to close the gap and mm. it's, it's i've seen some horrible scars and and you know stories from people that had that done and it's extremely painful after that, you really had the plug grafts, which is the, the forefather of the FUE, which we're doing today, except the, the grafts were very big. You were, mm. you were using big punches. So instead of taking one graft where you have one, two, three, or four hairs in them, you were taking chunks of hair. So this was the doll's hair that they talk about. And so you could see like there's a spot here, and there's like six hairs growing out. Another spot here, and another six hairs. And it was very artificial. Uh, after that came the FUT, and, and the FUT is, is a strip hair transplant, and, and that's what I had. That's a huge step from the rest of it. So you cut out the strip, dissect all the hair follicles from that strip, uh, and prepare them. But you were implanting for the first time, you were implanting actually just like one hair follicle at a time. Mm. So the results were a lot more natural than, than, than with the previous ones. Uh, but they did obviously leave a, quite a big scar. So you know, we would cut approximately from the ear to the other one, and, and this can go up to be 25, 30 centimeters long, uh, one and a half to two centimeters wide. Then you pull the scalp together, stitch it all. And I think uh, that's, that's one you had, didn't you? You, you had the, the strip correct. as yeah. well, yeah, yeah. So you know the, <laughs> you know the feeling, yeah. just, just as me. Uh, it's, it's not great, is it, when you're, when you're recovering from that, when you're sleeping on the back of your head? No, because definitely not. And you've got to, yeah, you've got a pillow there, and uh, it's, it's yeah. a lot longer healing time than the FUE these yeah. days. Yeah, and it's, you know, you, your scalp is very dormant for quite a long time. You, you, it feels numb, it feels weird. Sometimes the scar stretches out, uh, et cetera. And, we had people that had great results, you know, really, really good results. And we had all those where the scar stretched out, you got keloid mm-hmm. scarring, got, got different things. And then the FUE sort of a starts coming in sort of a, the 2010, 2011. It's sort of a start. It's, it's very small in the beginning. The, the adoption is, is slow. There are a few clinics doing them. Uh, they're charging, a re- I mean, when they started doing FUE, I would say in London, we were, we were paying like 25 grand for yeah. a, for hair transplant, was very expensive, mm. uh, but the, the results were not very good. So in the beginning, when they started, we were doing like thousand grafts in a, in a surgery, and it's just not enough with the strip. We could do two and a half, three thousand. So it was not really any competition in the beginning. But with time, you know, we, we, we kept on going, adapting the technique, got better and better. Us obviously in other clinics that were were doing it at the same time, and I think sort of a. 2015, 2016, it really starts sort of uh, overtaking the FUE, FUT procedure. And today, I mean, it's it's very rare. We barely do any FUT surgeries. Uh, I think most of our surgeons don't even remember how to how to do them anymore. But so today, it's it's basically it's only FUE that's that's mm-hmm. being done. It's and what's changed, like I said, from the beginning, we're doing maybe thousand grafts. I mean, we we've, we've done six thousand grafts in a single surgery. So. Your average surgery is probably about two and a half, three thousand thousand grafts, but we can do really, really high numbers, and the results are as good or if not better than they were with the with the old strip technique. Which is which is great. There's a lot of talk at the moment around sort of um, cloning um, yeah. and cloning hair. So tell us a little bit about that. Do you think do you think it's possible to clone your hair? We, we, we have a joke about this in the industry that it's, it's always five years away. So when mm. I start going to, to meetings and seeing things, 
you know, it, it, let's say a year 2000, it was five years away. 2005, it was five years away. And, and now 2023, it's still five years away from, from being reality. So I, I don't think we're going to see that happen anytime soon. Uh, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's really, really a lot of, uh, it's been tried quite a few times and it's never been really successful. And the main reason for people wanting that is because they haven't got enough donor area yeah. there to, to cover. I mean, it, it's it's a great idea, and there've been some some variations of that. Uh, they've been trying to take like parts of the hair follicle out. So instead of taking like if you have a graft in the back with with three or four hair follicles, mm. they've they've tested taking out two of the hairs, leave two of them, and the theory is that it should regrow and and go there. But I've seen the results, and it doesn't really work. So. Mm. Today, FUE hair transplant done nicely is fantastic. If people don't have the donor area, we can always look at something like taking it from the from the neck, the beard. Usually, get quite pretty good results transplanting right. hair from the neck, chest. You know, it it, it works, but it's not the same. Uh, and and it, I mean, you can extract from the legs, you can extract from the back, shoulders, pretty much. Everywhere. But I mean, ninety nine point nine percent of cases, you're just using normal scalp hair. Mm. Okay. Um, so in terms of, uh, we, so you do the FUE, we do the FUE um, technique at the moment, and then of course you've mentioned FUT and a number yeah. of other techniques. How about DHI? Talk, DHI. To, talk to me a little bit around that. This, this is a funny one because DHI is, stands for direct hair implantation. Mm. So this was started with, uh, with a clinic uh, where they started calling this direct hair implantation or the DHI method. Mm. What they use is actually what's called a choy implanter. So this is a pen-like implanter where you load the grafts into a, to a needle. So the needle is whole on the inside. If you imagine the graft is put there, inject, you, you put the needle in and then it sort of injects the the graft in mm. there. So if you, if you think about this, the first you extract it. So number one, DHI is not different to FUE. It, you use the FUE, DHI is just the implantation. So what they do with it with the DHI, they take the grafts after implantation, put them into the pen. So they have to take them with a tweezer, have to put them into the pen. You have to then put it into the scalp and release it. Uh, the theory was that this was less damage to the follicle than the, the sort of a stick in place method, which is mostly used. So the difference there that you have a, uh, have a incision pen really where you, you put in and then you use a tweezer to put the graft directly into the scalp. Uh, nothing against the DSI method, but I've never seen really good uh, any benefits over just normal stick in place method. Uh, it tends to work better on very thick hair. So you see, for example, it was, it's from Korea. It's, it's, it works very well on Asian hair. When you have finer European hair, it tends to break a lot more. Mm. So uh, I think it's, uh, for us here, we, we've tried and tested in every single clinic and we've always gone back just to the mm. good old stick in place method. And in terms of FUE, is, is, is that the healing time exactly the same as DHI? DHI is exactly the same. It's just the differences in, the, in the implantation. So there is, there is no difference there really. The, the difference is the sort of a, when we do the incisions, it's uh, it's with a blade. So if you think about it, it's almost like a like a paper cut. It's very fine. When you do it with a needle, it's a it's a round uh, it's it's a round hole that you place it there. Mm -hmm. So in theory, you can really put more density when you do the use it with the normal blades than the DHI needle. Mm. How about sapphire blades then? Yeah, I mean that that's another one that's become quite popular now in the, in the last few years. <sighs> I mean. I don't know if it's necessarily better. Uh, th there, are, there are some surgeons who really like to use that and prefer that over the, the other blade, while others prefer the other one. The theory is that you have faster healing, but I, I honestly haven't really seen much that can support that. I, they're great blades, uh, but at the end of the day, it's much more important in, in whose hands they are. So a good yeah, surgeon right. can get the same results with, with a, a sapphire blade or a normal. Mm. How about needleless anesthetic then? So. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting that. one. We've we've been trying this for the last few years uh, because the biggest complaint from people that have hair transplants, if they have a complaint, is that they didn't like when the anesthesia was being administered mm. and, and because it can be quite uncomfortable to numb up the, the whole area on the back. So what the needle-free anesthesia, you, you load it into a, to a device, it uses pressure then to inject it directly into the scalp without the use of a needle. And mm. if we say somebody felt pain on the scale of one to 10 and, and they were at six or seven with the injection, they say two or three, you barely feel it at all with the, 
with the needle like so I, I'm a big fan of the yeah. of the needle free one. But uh, is it just just as effective? Yeah, yeah. and uh, we we've had people that didn't want to come back for the second surgery where they've lost more hair because they just said I'm not going through that anesthesia again. But after we got the needle free, they're they're happy to do it, and they they said it's a it's a yeah. completely different ball game. Think out the whole procedure. I mean, probably thinking the need the needle side is probably the most is probably the most painful part of the whole procedure. Yeah. But, but but having said that, it's very important how that is done because it's it, like with any other treatment, you can if you do that slowly, you take take the time, and they, they're doing this in a, in a way, it is really not that bad. Uh, if they are hurrying, as you see in some clinics, where they're really rushing through it, they're not really sort of listening to the patient, they're not adapting to to him, uh, then it can be quite painful. So mm. again, I think you know, yes, it's definitely more painful to do it do it with that method. But in the hands of a good surgeon, it it should not really be that painful. So in terms of hair transplants, what's the biggest mistake that you you can make? In, <sighs> that, that, in that, delivering that, 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 there are many. There there are really <laughs> many there. What what I like to I mean, I, when I speak to loads of people, obviously, about hair transplants, the first question that people ask you usually when they see you is, what do you do? And they expect you to be a, you know, you're a banker or you work in this or you're that. And you say, I work with hair transplants. And so, oh, okay. And it comes really like a, like a flood of questions after that. Uh, and, and when I tell them I had one, they say, but I, I, I would never have, you know, seen that you had one. And, and then when I answered, but that's the whole point. You're not supposed to be able <laughs> yeah, to see it. Definitely. You know, if if I look at somebody and I can see he had a hair transplant, then for me it's not a not a great hair transplant. So the design of the hairline and how the implantation is done there, I think is the is the first mm-hmm. sign. And I see a lot of lot of clinics making huge mistakes. They're doing feminine lines, they're closing it, curving it the wrong way on the sides, the angles are all wrong, it, it grows in different angles. So, you know, a hair transplant done you know, more or less, or hair transplant done nicely, there is a huge difference between the the two. So when it's done nicely, you should not be able to notice that somebody had a hair transplant. It should just look like he has a nice head of hair. Yeah, I think you're right. There's definitely some some people I've seen, and you can tell. Um, yeah, yeah, straight away. Mm. You know, and the, the other big one, just just so we continue on that. I mean, which which we see a lot. So I would say for, number one, it's the design. Uh, mm. We go very wrong, and the angles very often follow that. We see that uh, very often when people come from surgery abroad, especially it's a, it's a very odd shape on the hairline and it's feminine and it's, you know, guys get quite upset when you explain to them that they've actually created a feminine hairline for them. Uh, but the other big one is to preserve the donor area. So, so the FUE, if you imagine you've got all this hair in the back, we're extracting one hair follicle and we need to leave a few hair follicles around it. And then we extract another one, leave this, and you need to spread that evenly out on the back. If you do it too aggressively on a on a small part, you are going to create sort of a bald spot. Mm. And a really aggressive surgeries that we've seen is has left people with horrible scarring, really bad hair loss in the back, and so they might have more hair on the top, but now they're bald at the back instead. And it's very difficult to fix because they've destroyed the the donor area. Uh, and the only thing we can do is do scalp pigmentation or something to camouflage it, but it's it's never going to be the same. So that's that's a big no no, and it's a, something we see a lot. Mm. How about imperfections of the hair hairline as well? So yeah, creating uh, some imperfections. You, you need to create the imperfections or the irregularities, like uh, like we talk about. So usually, let's say you you design a hairline and it has like you know a specific shape. Within that hairline, you create a little bit of uh, irregularities. Uh, a lot of clinics and, and surgeons do the mistake of doing like triangular zigzags in the front and keep them regular. That's that's no longer a irregularity. You actually mm-hmm. just create a different shape. So you need to be very subtle with it. You need to create a little bit of irregularities, and then, then the hairline is going to be extremely natural. And of course, you need to put singular hair uh, in the front. If you put you know two, threes, and fours, it's going to look plucky, and it's, it's not going to look very nice. Yeah. I've seen many of those as well. So yeah. you're right. You start with the ones and then the twos behind. Yeah, yeah, and then you start building the density. But like the, the first line is is really which makes and breaks the hair transplant in the in the sense if you're going to be able to spot it or not. Mm, yeah, that's good. Um, so we talked about earlier. You talked about PRP and and mesotherapy. Yeah, and we offer that at Vinci. Yeah, uh, th- these have been coming along for. I mean, mesotherapy is uh, is a technique from France. It, it's used for all kinds. It's basically so mesotherapy is just localized injections mm. to uh, to to treat any kind of condition. It can be used to treat different conditions. So we started using this. Oh, 
well, more than 10 years ago, we, we, we started experimenting with that. We were injecting phenasteroid, minoxidil, growth factors, uh, and we, we've experimented a few, few different versions. Uh, and that we saw really good results with for a long time. Then the PRP started coming in. It was, you know, w- w- was held like it was the you know cure for baldness. And that. It's, it's not that, but it but it helps a lot. Again, it's a it's a treatment that could be used for you know athletic injuries, burns, all kinds of, of different things, facial rejuvenation even. Mm. So you take the take the blood from the body, spin it in the centrifuge, separate the platelets and plasmas, and inject into the scalp where the hair is thinning. And what tends to happen is the hair starts growing thicker and healthier back. Uh, so we've been testing different protocols with different intensities. And I think a lot of people were, were disappointed, and we saw this from many clinics, that people were doing PRP and saying, PRP just doesn't work. Uh, it, it's not that it doesn't work, but you mm-hmm. need the correct protocol. And when you do the two together, when you do PRP one session, and then two to four weeks later, you do a mesotherapy, and then you continue like that, we get so much better results than with just one on its own. So, so the two mm-hmm. complement each other, and the results are are amazing. I mean, I was on finasteride and minoxidil for a for a very long time. I, uh, I still use minoxidil uh, or maxogain brand uh, here at Vinci, but I stopped using them probably like f- six, seven years ago. I, I decided no. I've I've seen enough results with our PRP with our mesotherapy. I'm confident enough that if I stop that, I'll maintain my hair just doing the treatment, and, and that's what's worked. And it's funny when I, because my I transplant in the front, this is all natural here in the back, never never been messed with. So if I'm traveling, I'm, I'm really busy, and, and I really don't follow the protocol myself, uh, and it passed, let's say, six, seven weeks without having a treatment, I, I start noticing that actually the crown starts opening up, and I can see a little bit more of the scalp. Yeah. Uh, I start doing the treatments, two to four weeks later, it's closed up again. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And I think it does take a bit of time, doesn't it, to actually yeah. start working? I think that's it because everyone wants instant results. Yeah, I mean, the hair goes through growth stages. You know, the growth happens underneath the hair. It then has to grow up there, and before it's visible, it's, it's not straight away. And mm. I mean, I don't know how many people I've seen and they said, "Oh, I, I tried the medication. I tried this. It didn't really work." And I ask, "How long did it take?" It oh, it's like a whole month, and it's like not going to work. It's like going two times to the gym and expect to be, you know, fit. It's, it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. So you really need three to six months. To, you, you might be lucky. I mean, there are people who see results even in the first month. Yeah, we've but, seen that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it happens. But just to keep the feet on the ground and look up to the sky and, you know, so think three to six months. Uh, and I say six to 12 months really to get the best results. But in three to six months, usually you see good results. Yeah, great. We've, we've had a lot of um, our clients that we've, we've provided hair transplants too um but they said that they were really searching and looking at turkey um so i was just wanted to know your views on on turkey um, uh, and turkish hair transplants as an as an interesting one uh turkey is, is relatively new on the market i mean they, they came on I, I never heard of turkey for the first years that, that our clinics were open uh, it, it didn't exist nobody went to turkey uh actually one of our uh, of our surgeons that worked with us in Dubai, Dr. Riyad Rumi, some years ago, he he was flown over to Turkey from from London here. Uh, that's probably back in the sort of uh, let's say around 2010, when he flew over to Turkey and and did a hair transplant to show the surgeons there how to how to do them. So Turkey plays that they, they, they are like where where all the hair transplant began, which is obviously nonsense. But what Turkey has done is they in the beginning they lowered the prices a lot. I mean. In the beginning, you were seeing fifteen hundred dollars for a for a hair transplant, uh, and they did it on on volume. So mm-hmm. different to what we do, for example, here in in London, is is you have to take time with the patient. You have to plan the surgery. The surgeon is always there, uh, so you you have a lot of really security. Everything is CQC registered. The GMC registered doctors. Everything is monitored. So the only way to offer that price is to cut some corners, and and you know you have to do a lot of surgeries and you have to cut out the time for the doctor. So what they did that changed the market a little bit is they really pushed the graft numbers. Uh, mm. they, they really, really pushed up the numbers and they did in many times way too much. So you have a lot of those depleted donor areas that, that come from Turkey. But with time, you got some some really good clinics there. So there's some really, really good prime clinics in Turkey, but those are not the clinics that are charging you 1,500 or 2,000 pounds. Mm. These these clinics are the same price as you would pay anywhere else in Europe. I mean, they're charging four or five thousand for a for a hair transplant, and like I said, so 
anybody going to to travel and do a hair transplant, you really have to look into into what you what is being done. I mean, there was a warning from from the from the UK government, where the warning I think twenty two Brits have died in in cosmetic surgeries mm. in, in yeah, Turkey. So it, it's it's serious. I mean, you can die if if it goes wrong. It's a very simple procedure. You'd have no complication if it's done correctly, but you need to make sure that you're you're safe. Mm. How have you ensured that, like us at Vinci or we at Vinci, have, have, have got the best procedures in place? I mean, a huge part of that is our Vinci Medical Academy, which is our, our training program for all our surgeons and technicians. So, uh, when somebody comes to start doing hair transplant, uh, it's not a speciality within medicine per se. So you have doctors from different specialty do it, doing hair transplant. You have GPs, dermatologists, sometimes plastic surgeons, even though they're not not a lot of them doing them internal medicine different specialty. When they come to us, most of them, uh, excluding the dermatologists, know very little about hair. So we have to educate them basically from A to Z on, on hair, hair loss, uh, hair transplants, and how, how everything everything works. It's, it's been changing in the last years. There, there are more and more like courses and, and some medical schools that actually have some departments dedicated to hair. So this probably will change in the next few years. But for a long time, I it was really no training program other than like our internal training program. So when the doctors start, they will go through a training program, an internship in, in different locations. So let's say somebody is starting in, in London, he might start to, to be there shadowing the, the other surgeons that are there. He might fly to Malaga, might fly to Sao Paulo, somewhere else, and then come back after uh, after a few months of training. So you do have this sort of a collective knowledge that we have. And we have clinics in Africa, we have clinics in South America, we have clinics here, and you know, all over, over. And all the doctors, they tend to share the knowledge, the technicians tend to share the knowledge. So things like uh, African hair is, is, is something that was, in the beginning, people said, you can't do that with FUE. They said, because the hair is curly and you have a straight punch, you're gonna damage the hair. And, and it was true in the, in the beginning. But with time, we've, we've developed a, a technique to do that. And today we, can, we don't do FUT anymore on, on Afro hair. We can do FU either. So it's, this, this is one thing that came out of this sort of a partnership between the clinics in, in different continents and countries. Mm. You spoke about Malaga there. Um, yeah. And and our Malaga think is very 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 busy in terms of um, from from English people, so from people that come over from England to go to Malaga. How have you made the customer experience uh, easy for for people to go over there? Yeah, I mean, we we started doing this sort of a medical tourism way before Turkey ever started. Mm. <laughs> I think they copied our our model, but like back in the day, I would say, especially when you're talking, you're going back to to maybe 2010. Uh, hair transplant had more of a stigma to it. Mm. So especially with some of our British clients, they did not really want anybody to know they had a hair transplant. It was it was a big secret. Uh, so they preferred to fly to Malacca, have a hair transplant, spend a little time out there, then they come back and then it's not really that visible they had anything done. That was a, that was a big, big deal for them. So we designed all the program in Malacca. So obviously we have a lot of Spanish clients as well, but I would say the, the bulk of our clients are coming from, from, from the UK, from, from Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, or Scotland. So it's it's changed today. But we, we try to make that very smooth. We pick up the patients at the airport when they come. So somebody will be waiting for them with a sign, takes them to the hotel, which is just around the corner from the clinic. They come to the clinic, have a good chat, uh, have the surgery done, come the day after. I would say the difference in Malaga, it's a little bit more of a relaxed vibe mm. than we have. Uh, it's, it's slightly different. I mean, doing the same procedure, it's the same result. But a, a lot of people really like going out there and, and having that extra time. A bit of a holiday too. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some some clients. What's the most What's the most challenging client for a hair transplant that you've actually ha had in front of you? <sighs> the, <laughs> I, I have to go with uh, Hafthor Björnsson, the mountain from, from Game of Thrones. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that was a challenging one because he had that transplant. I, I can't remember the year, but it's probably about four years ago. Um, what about that? Let's, in that region. So he's, he's obviously a giant of a man, you know, he, yeah. he's weighing <laughs> something 170 to 190 kilos. So the first challenge was our, our surgical beds, they can't handle his weight. So <laughs> we had to think, how, how, how are we going to get that guy to lie down somewhere <laughs> and get him done? So we managed to sort it out. We bought a, a special surgery bed to, to get him done and thought, okay, that's good. So the next one was when he, when he came in, went through all his, all his things. He had to eat every two hours. So we had to stop the surgery every two hours to, to get him to eat. And, uh, you know, you need to maintain that amount of muscle you, you need to eat. 
But before the surgery, there was another one. We were trying to take his blood pressure, and his bicep is bigger than my thigh, obviously. So <laughs> we could not put it on his hand. There was just no chance. And I, I ended up running out on Harley Street in the morning, going to uh, to a medical store where they had uh, special uh, monitors for for obese people, where um, and we could fit that finally on his on his arm. Wow. Then when the when the surgery starts. Uh, because we were at a, it was not our usual chair, it was, and he's really, really tall. I mean, so when he was there, the girls actually had to sit on a little stair when they were planting in the hair. So it, it, that that was a challenging, really, really challenging hair transplant. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Um, I only just want to talk about other hair transplants. It's not just about transplanting hair on top of your head, is it? We do, we do, other, we do more we do. than that. Yeah. So, what do you think of the results on, say, beard transplants or eyebrow transplants? Beard transplants oh. are fantastic. Uh, I don't remember so. For, for those who don't know, beard transplants is mm. when you have any flaws in the beard. Some people don't have a beard at all, to be honest. We take hair here from the back, just like with a hair transplant, but mm. instead of putting it on the scalp, we put it into the beard. Uh, and with time, this will grow more and more like beard. You know, you obviously cut it the same way. We put the angles correctly, and it, it looks great. I mean, the satisfaction rate with beard transplant is, is extremely, extremely high. I mean, I, I don't remember a single client that was unhappy with a, with a beard transplant. Wow. Eyebrows... Are, are more challenging because your eyebrows throw in three different directions depending on where you are in the eyebrow. Uh, and th they are a little bit finer than the rest of your hair. So it can be challenging to find a hair that is a match for the eyebrow. So you really have to extract lower from the sort of a nape hair where it's a little bit finer. You have to make the angles really correct and everything has to be has to be perfect for that to work. So it's a, it's a, it's a more complicated surgery in that sense. It's a, I mean, we're not doing a huge number of grafts. Uh, so I would say Women overall are usually really happy with the results. They're used to trimming their eyebrows because they will grow mm. long. So for, for guys, they will complain. They will have to cut their eyebrows like every week. Otherwise, they would just go and, you know, cover, <laughs> cover their eyelids. Uh, so besides these, I mean, we've done eyelash transplants as well. Wow. They, they, they're, they're quite specific. Uh, I mean, what, what you do is you use an old surgical needle and you kind of thread it through here and pull it through and it gets so the root gets stuck under there but it's 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 nice for those who don't have any eyelashes but it's not really a so, so like a cosmetic enhancement so uh, for, for the girls out there that's thinking that they can just do that instead of using fake eyelashes no i, I wouldn't mm. reco recommend that but uh the well i wouldn't say the funniest but but one of the strangest requests that we had this is not something we get very common was uh, was a guy in dubai in our clinic Full head of hair, really, really good looking guy, but he want, he had, didn't have any hair on his chest. So his his dream was to have like a really hairy chest. He said, I, when I go to the <laughs> beach, you know, I look at all the men, they all have this, this hair and I'm I'm smooth like a little kid. I, I don't really like it. We, we tried to talk him out of it and he came and he persisted and said, okay, we'll, we'll do it in the end. And we, we did a transplant where we actually took from the scalp and, and recreated this sort of uh, chest and, <laughs> and and body hair. That was that was. W one of very few I haven't, we haven't repeated that in I think in 10 years so can we do a surgery if someone wants a beard transplant and a hair transplant on the same day depends on the size of the area so let's mm. say if you're, if you're doing a small area on the on the front and you just have some gaps and then you could you should be able to do it if it's a lot of grafts that you need mm. to do it's a large area on the top it's a large beard you it's really recommended to do it in two but it's it's all about how long it takes. It takes mm. slightly longer to do a beard transplant. We, mm. we have to be a little bit more careful. We want to make sure that you don't get too much swelling. We want, to want everything to go smoothly. So it, it all depends on the case. Um, you hear a lot of, see a lot of advertising saying, oh, we can put this amount of hairs in, we can put this amount of grafts in. What's the difference yeah. between grafts and hairs? Yeah, so a, a graft is a, is a unit where you have the hairs in. So they will grow naturally. If We, we show people this very often on, uh, on, a, on a trichoscopes where we put it on the scalp and show them on a screen. So when you, when you put the microscope here on the back and see it on the screen, you can see where the hair starts growing out. You can have one hair like you have in the hairline. Mm. You can have two, three, four, and sometimes even five and six, which is rare. But on average, you're going to have one to four hairs growing in each graft. So when you do a hair transplant, let's say you do 10 grafts, you might be doing 23 hairs. You know? So some clinics, uh, and especially uh, further back, I don't see this as much today, but they always confused people by quoting hairs. So mm -hmm. they said, I'll, I'll do 1,000 hairs for you. 1,000 hairs is, is 300 or something grafts. It's, it's nothing. It's not, it's not going to cover like a, 
you know, 50, 50 pence uh, <laughs> side with, with her, it's not gonna do anything for you. So people need to understand the, the difference between a graft and a hair. So the other thing that some clinics, when they're charging hair is what they can do and have done in the past, is they take the graft, which has mm. four hairs in it, and they just slice it up. All of a sudden you have four hairs, now you need to pay for four. Uh, wow. But that doesn't give you any density because you can imagine like, you know, you, you have just singular hairs instead of having something with real density, it's gonna be a see-through transplant. It, it's terrible results, but we, we've seen that. I, I mean, I've, I've seen it all in, <laughs> in this, but people really have to be careful. There's, uh, there, there is, I would say it's better today than it was, but there's still a lot of cowboys mm. out there doing hair yeah. transplants. And you talked about earlier just around sort of creating a, a natural hairline and yeah. using ones and twos. How about the crown then? So what would you what would you do with a crown if someone had a quite a large area yeah. um, that was exposed? You, then you really want to select the, the the bigger grafts. So the beauty of the FUE, so instead of the strip, you just took out the strip, and what mm. you have in the strip is what you have to work with. You don't really select the grafts per se. But when you do an FUE, you can actually select to extract them from where you have the most of two, threes, and fours. So you, if you're doing a crown, you really want to get as many two, threes, and fours because they're the, what gives you the density. So whenever you're doing the crown, you want the thickest possible hairs extracted from the from the area. So you have to plan plan this out in the beginning. If, you, if you're working on a crown, you're going to have a slightly different extraction than if you're working on a hairline where you want a lot of lot of singular hairs in the front. Mm, okay. And we talked about ethnicity really about asian hair being slightly different yeah um, caucasian hair being different again slightly thinner um how about afro hair um talk to us about yeah afro it's, hair and it's the experience the, you've had with that the, the challenge of afro hair is this is if it's very curly so the curliness is not only on the outside that you see but it's actually underneath so if you imagine we have a if the, if the scalp is here we see where the hair comes out we go in with the puns but the root is actually not straight underneath and it's difficult to see where it is. So we have to go a little bit more superficial uh, and pull it more out and without breaking the hair. So it's probably the most challenging hair that you have for a hair transplant. Uh, and, and for a long time, it was still done with FUT. But in the last, I would say maybe five years, we've, we've really switched, we've, we've put a lot more effort into it. We can still do fewer hairs or grafts in a, in a single surgery than with straight hair but we can get really good results. And the, the other thing with afro or curly hair is it actually covers a larger area, so you don't mm. need the same density. So it's sort of a compensate for the lower graft numbers. Yeah, definitely. Can we talk about um, micro skin pigmentation a little bit? Yeah, uh, micro scalp pigmentation is, is something that we've been doing for a very long time. Uh, and, and this was sort of a natural development of having a lot of people. So they come in for a hair transplant, and are not candidates. Mm. And, and you know, when we were only doing hair transplants, the only thing I could say is that you, you don't really have the donor area. Uh, it, it's not gonna be a nice result. I cannot achieve what you what you want to do. And we had to send them away. Uh, and, and with time, we started sort of looking into, into options, started experimenting with this. And, and this grew from being something very nice. I mean, I think there were two or three places in the whole world doing this when we when we started doing this, and it was uh, I mean we all knew each other. It was just a few few of us doing it, and we sort of advanced with it. We changed the we got our own pigments. We've done the the formula with all our own setup, and it's so good now that if you look up close, uh, I cannot distinguish what is the hair and what is the actual pigmentation. Amazing. So. The needles are so fine. If I if I push on the needle, it, it will bend. They're, they're they're very soft and they are they're thrusted into the skin and leave a very very fine mark there, and it just looks like a hair follicle growing out. And mm -hmm. we use that for guys that like to shave. Uh, we use that to cover scars. We use that on. Well, it's really good on FUE scars where people have had aggressive FUEs and you see the sort of uh, spots behind. Uh, we use that to cover that. We use that on people that have just fine hair or just want higher density without having a, another surgery. Mm. So there's loads and loads of uses for it, and it, it lasts really long. I mean, our, our main concern in the beginning, because we were starting, we, we couldn't, people asked, and how long is it going to last? And I said, I really can't tell you because we've not <laughs> been doing it doing it that long. I would say we, we were sort of expecting it to be, be one to two years before you need to touch up. 
But in reality, most people don't need to come back until after five to seven years. And, you know, it, it lasts a lot longer and stays really nicely in the scalp, much better than we, we sort of dared to expect. So I'm, I'm really happy with that. And now with all this experience that we have, we're now giving, you know, a five-year warranty. If, you know, come, you do the treatment, we get you looking looking great. If you need anything within the first five years, we, we just do it for free. There's no, no mm. issue. Talk to us a little bit around the process um, and the healing time. Of the pigmentation? Yeah. I mean, the pigmentation is, is relatively simple. It, it, it depends on if you're doing, let's say, a shaved hair or, mm. or if you're doing a long hair. The main thing is that the scalp needs to be in good condition. It, this, is, this is essential. And I, I always use this. We see this especially with clients that are a lot out in the sun. So when we're doing it in Miami or doing it in, you know, in Rio de Janeiro or somewhere where people are, are out in the sun, scalp gets really dry. And if you imagine, if you have a piece of paper and you drop a drop of coffee on it, you'll see how it spreads in the, on, on the paper. The same things happens in the scalp. If it's really dry, we cannot really make the impression look natural mm -hmm. because it's naturally going to spread in there. So it happens that we have to send people home uh, and get them to come back in a few days to, to hydrate their, their scalp. But you can use an A and D ointment, anything just to, to be, and stay out of the sun for, mm -hmm. for the last few days. Uh, another really challenging one is if people are wearing wigs so wigs or hair system or whatever you want to want to call them where they're glued on the top of the scalp they don't let the scalp breathe very well it doesn't get any sun and when you take it off it's it's discolored often you know it's it's a very strange texture to it and you really need to let it breathe and and be natural so we always tell people take it off leave it off for a, for a week you know put on a baseball cap if you don't want anybody to see it but go a little bit out get a little bit of you know fresh air there put some moisturizer on and, and get the scalp looking a lot better so these are the preparations really for the for the scalp pigmentation there isn't really much else that you you need to do before I mean, afterwards, you will notice a little bit of redness. I mm. mean, that subsides in a, in a few hours. So you don't really need to do anything. But you cannot, you know, you're, you're not going to go into the sauna the, the same day. You, yeah. you have, to, have to stay a little bit out of that. So when you go into the shower, just have it hit you on the back of the back of the neck. Don't do it straight. Just try to stay out of that for the past sort of a four to five days, ideally. Uh, and then it's, it's going to heal, heal nicely. But... People do need more than one session. Right. So, so, so this, this is an important because sometimes they say, oh, I'm, I'm going to just one visit. No, we, we, we need to do more than one. And so let's say we, we're going to do the whole top of the head. We're going to cover all of that on the, f on the first session. But every scalp is different. So we have a, a different range with, with 50 colors in, in which we have every different tone. We will place in the what we think is the best mats, but we will always sort of go on the lighter side because if it's light, we can always go darker. If it's too dark, it's not so easy to go go light. So on the first session, we will mix that in. We we'll leave it for you know ten days, two weeks, ideally. Then they come back. We do the second session. We see how the pigment went in. If we need to you know go up a tone, continue with the same one, create added density, do some changes to the hairline or whatever, and then usually on the third session, it's it's done. So you have three to four hours if you're doing a relatively large area uh, and and two to three visits to to get it done for in, so, in some cases yeah amazing and that's, that's the same with long head same as long as it's actually easier with long hair because then it's obviously hidden between the the existing hair uh but it's the same you, can, you cannot wash the hair but you you sometimes need slightly more sessions because you can imagine we're going in between the hairs it's it's easier to miss a spot or or somewhere it didn't take as well because we, we can't see the areas and it's issues when you're working with a shaved head you can see everything you know mm. we can do it perfectly it's the same with hair transplants people often ask you know do i need to shave it say, they need to shave the donor area yes the top it's ideal if they shave it it makes our job a lot easier because as i tell them if, if we're going in between existing hair it's possible that we're going to miss some spots there mm. because we can't really see it the same uh, so it's the same with, with the pigmentation. It's, it's a little bit more challenging when the hair is long. Great. So minimal healing time with uh, MSP. Um, how about hair transplantation? So, yeah, I mean, physically, you'll feel fine. I mean, uh, doing an FUE is, 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 is relatively simple. I mean, mm. but what I tell people, it, it, physically, you'll do fine, but you do have to take it easy. We, we, we're going to have made, you know, in our surgery, 3,000, 3,500 incisions on the top of your scalp. We put in the hairs there. So the first thing is people can get swelling. So the swelling starts sort of in the in the forehead area. Uh, and we have a post-op kit that we offer that has an ice pack, and we recommend them. Put that in the freezer, put it on when you start seeing the swelling. If you do that from the beginning, usually it stops. But like when I had my 
first hair transplant, I, I, I got really, really badly swollen. I wasn't told about the eyes. I didn't do any of it. And I had to hide. No, I, I, I mean, it was, <laughs> we were talking. It, it was a few to the back. I looked like the elephant man. It was a, it was a really, <laughs> really terrible swelling. And after a few days, went down to my eyes and my face was deformed for a long time. We, <laughs> hair transplants today, for are a lot better. So when you see the swelling, if you, you use all the kit, you put on the eyes there, you're not gonna you're not gonna go really bad. Uh, so the other thing is, so straight after the hair transplant, you see all the hairs that you think, fantastic, I got my hair back. I don't, I don't need to worry about this. <laughs> but then, you know, they come a little bit of scabs when it's doing the healing and you clean the scabs in maybe seven days and it starts looking quite good. The redness is gone mostly in the back and it looks nice. And this is the, the sort of a honeymoon period in the beginning. Everybody's really <laughs> happy. Yes, look at me, look at my new <laughs> hairline. <laughs> really excited. But then in a few weeks after that, sort of a four to six weeks, it really it starts falling out. Yeah. Uh, and it's most of it falls out, people say, but how much will fall out? Uh, I, I can't tell you. It's it's impossible. So people keep all of it pretty much, don't they? But some, but it's, so it's very rare. rare. I always say, don't yeah. count on that. And if yeah. you do, then just you know count your blessings because you, you're really, really <laughs> lucky. <laughs> but but there is a phase, you know, it's really nice in the beginning. Then the phase that comes from when the hair starts falling out, they start growing again. It can be a little bit of redness in the area. You can see slight bumps on there when the hair is pushing through. And and many people call call this uh, the ugly duckling phase. Uh, it, it doesn't look great. But in three to four months, it starts looking a lot better again. In six months, usually it looks looks really nice. How about 12 months and 18 months? Oh, 12 months is, is, is when you should have <laughs> almost everything. It, wow. it can still increase in density. So, I mean, I would say six months, you're probably going to have about 70% of your results. I mean, some people will have a little bit less. Some will have a little bit more. But we usually talk 12 to 18 months to see the final results. But I would say 12 months, you're going to see 99% of our clients are, are seeing the final results. There are still some growth to be, be had in some but most of it you'll see at 12 months. Mm. So through that journey, throughout that sort of first day of having the transplant done to the, the sort of 12 months to 18 months, what sort of aftercare does, does, does Vinci give yeah, to his clients? I mean, it, it's different now. When, when we did the, the strip transplant, people needed to come back 10 days later for, uh, for a stitch removal, yeah. which was quite painful. Uh, but today we, we give a, we have a post-op kit which people can can get in the clinic which has everything for you and this is just what we've learned through these all this time that we've been doing it. How can we heal the how, how can we speed up the healing as much as possible? So what we have there, we have the ice pack, we have a, a pillow that you can you can sleep on because it might be uncomfortable to lie on the on the area in the beginning. So when you're lying down, you just put that that sort of a travel pillow onto your neck. We have oil that's essential to get rid of the scabs. So, so what happens when the healing starts? You you see a little scabs that will form in the hair. You can't pull them out because you might actually damage the graft mm. in the beginning. So, what we do is we rub it in with that that oil, softens it out. We have a, a shampoo that is especially antibacterial, just to make sure everything is clean and nice when we take it off. Uh, and then we got the uh, minor steel, the max again, which is start after three weeks to use to stimulate the growth as well. So we got everything in this kit. If you follow that instructions, very rare that you have to come into the clinic. If you need, come and see us. No, no issue. Give us a call or or come in. But you can really do everything at home. But we do like to follow up with people. You know, ten days after the surgery, we, we follow up on the day after, we follow up 10 days after, we check on them three months after the surgery, six months, nine and 12 months. Mm. So you, you'll always have somebody looking looking up on you. If you have any issue, you can always come in and mm. see us. And and do we do other products as well? So do we do we other products? Do, do we cater for everyone's hair loss I, solutions? I, I, we, we try to cater for everyone's hair loss. Uh, I mean, th there's l everybody that has, let's say, the most common source of male or female pattern baldness, uh, we cater for. Even alopecia areata, we can do steroid injections and, and treatment. So I, I would say 99% of, mm -hmm. of cases we can we can treat. Uh, we do have vitamins, a really good vitamin blend called the Vitruvian line, where we put together everything that the hair needs to grow grow well, plus uh, soap palmetto, which is a DHT blocker. Mm -hmm. a, for those who don't know, the DHT is the hormone that's that's really the main cause between male path and baldness. So that's a fantastic product. The the other one is our Maxogain, which is a minoxidil based product with acetic acid. And what the acid does, it sort of uh, stimulates how it enters into the scalp. So we do six percent for men, uh, three percent for women. So if you, if you're doing the six percent with acetic acid, it's almost like you're having twelve percent minoxidil being put onto your scalp. 
I've tried the stronger blends, like where you, where you skip the acid and you just go straight to 12 or 15 percent minoxidil. And it, for me, it irritated my skin a lot, left mm -hmm. me flaking and dandruff and it's very aggressive. So we've, we've sort of perfectioned this through the years. It doesn't leave the scalp oily or it goes with in the first times when I was using using the minoxidil, it, I, I tend to get dandruff. It, it looked very oily and, and didn't look very good. We've, we've got rid of that with our product. We also have our, our laser cup, which is great. Mm. It uses a low laser light therapy, and that stimulates the, the growth cycle of the hair, uh, helps with healing, and, and all of these work really well together. So we've got plenty of options. It doesn't really matter what, the, if you're starting to lose hair, you know, you lost a lot of hair, you, you, you lost so much, you've had bad surgeries, we can usually come up with a, with a solution that's really going to improve the way that you look. Okay. Thinking back over your, your journey, because it's been a number of years now, so how many years has it been since you've started the, the company? Company? Uh, we're going on 18 years now. 18 oh, years, wow. wow. So what are you most proud of out of all that time? I, I, I most, I'm mostly proud of how many people we have helped. I yeah. mean, the, the, the number of people we have helped and the, and the way that we've, I mean, might sound like I'm uh, trying to make a, a, a cry story, but there, there are people where it's really changed their lives. I mean... The, We've had people that didn't want to go out. They didn't want to go to any social gatherings. They thought they could never have a girlfriend. They could, they could never really go dating. Uh, and it, it affects some people really, really badly. Uh, and, and we've been able to help those as well as the other ones who just bothers them to lose hair. And, uh, and I think we've changed a lot of lives. I'm, I'm really proud of that. Yeah, we get many, many, many clients come in about self-esteem with self-esteem yeah. issues that we've helped yeah um definitely create a solution to some of that and um it's amazing seeing that it's, it's so great to see people coming back when you see the results and you see that there's like there's, there's a little bit of more of a fire in the step and the, you, the, you see the, the the chest goes out a little bit more and, and they smile more and you can see this very often on the photos before you you see them a little bit you know feeling down when you take when they we take the initial photo when they're coming in because they're not feeling great and once they've gone through through the whole process and you know you see them smile a lot more and what's your what's your plans for the future then? So over the next sort of five ten years, where do you see Vinci? Well, we're continuing expanding. Yeah, you know, more and more clinics. We're we're opening a lot of clinics uh, at this moment. We're uh, opening up three clinics in the next four months in Brazil. We're opening up in up we have a new surgical clinic up in Manchester in, uh, in probably June July uh, about there and loads of other clinics that we're working on. So we're going to be in, in more places. Uh, we're going to want to make it easier. So, so our goal is to have a, a point where you can come to and you can be attended wherever you live. Yeah. Uh, and that means all over the world. So we, we still have quite a few places to go to and, and expand in the clinics. We continue to look at, you know, any changes in the surgery. Is there any improvements? We always make sure that we are on, on you know, the first ones to, to start and start applying any, any improvements. And the same with uh, with the treatments and products. We're always we're always trying to find better products, better ways, uh, and we will continuously do that. And things do move fast, don't they? Do move quickly. We see different things come into the market all the time in terms of drugs. Most of them come into the market and then disappear. I mean, that, that's what I would say. Like every two years, you'll see a, a wonder cure for bolting that then turns out to be nothing. I mean, or turns out to be something that's helpful, mm -hmm. but very far from from being a cure to bolting. So I'm, I'm I've become very skeptical with the time. I've seen so many miracle cure for boltings that's going to cure this compound or this and that, and in the end, it's 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 very rare that it mm -hmm. <laughs> it really works. But for us, what the main things on the market, or of the products. Mm -hmm. Or the products or the or the services. So products. So what's the main things that you feel do work? I mean, our Maxogain, obviously, minoxidil was the first FDA approved medication that, that was used for bolting. I mean, going back to 1980s then. So uh, the minoxidil was first taken orally. It was a blood pressure medication, and they started noticing people that were taking it. They started growing more hair. Then it went into a to a topical solution and being applied. So, I mean. It's been over 50 years use wow. of minoxidil for, for hair loss. So we know that it works. It's not a miracle cure. It, it tends to work better here on the back than it does in the front. But, but it, So we've perfectioned that into the Maxogain, like, like we've talked about. That works really well. Uh, I mean, the Vitruvian uh, line is, is really good. That's another one that's taken us a very long time to develop, and we've done changes over, over time. And some people have described it as steroids for hair because they, they notice they all of a sudden need to cut their hair a lot uh, and, and, and do, you know, 
it grows thicker, it, it grows a lot faster. You notice it in the nails as well, because the nails are made pretty much from the same material as the, as the hair. So whenever you have a supplement, it works for that. And I, I, I know that, I'm, I mean, I use them all. I, I, I'm yeah. the first to test anything that we do in the, in the clinic. Good. I heard, I heard you talk about uh, something the other day, actually, you were talking to, to me and someone else, but we mentioned Vinci Academy. So yeah. talk us through what Vinci Academy is. Um, plans really, for that. That's something that I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of, like we were talking about earlier, that there is so little training and there is so little sort of uh, body of knowledge available when it comes to hair and it's spread over, uh, over a long time. So in the beginning when we were doing training, we had a, had a certain database and we shared there, we, we started videotaping surgeries. And today we have a learning platform where, where all our surgical staff or anybody that works with hair transplant or hair restoration in our clinics, uh, they have to learn about hair transplant. So they learn about hair loss. They will learn about, they will see surgeries being done in the videos. And we use this training, obviously, a little bit less when you're working with people that are, are you know, answering inquiries or when we're working with surgeons, we really have a, have a big training program, anything from, from, you know, like diagnosing hair loss, what's the best treatment, doing the surgery, different ways of doing different things, and they can do through all, go through all this training online and then continue with, with their internship in, in one of our clinics. And, you know, this makes all the difference because, like I said, when you get somebody coming into a clinic to start working, they usually know very little about hair. We have to educate them. Mm, wow, that sounds amazing. Well, thank you, Salva, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very Great much. Great pleasure. Thank pleasure. you. Thank you.